Hi everybody, welcome to my channel, Life Law Thin. Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Now, I have been waiting for this episode uh, for a little while now, and I'm so happy that we have Matt Dave Singh, Such Dave, onto the channel today because we will be talking about securing common law pupillage. And the reason why I'm ex especially excited about this episode is because he was also an international applicant and he achieved or obtained pupillage. And for those of you international applicants out there, I am sure that this gives you hope that people can attain pupillage in England and Wales. So thank you very much for joining joining us, uh, Math Dave. Thank you, Nia, for having me. It's a real privilege um, to be here with you. Great. Now, before we just jump into everything else, let's give a, a quick fun fact. So those of you who have been following the channel know that we've had a, a stand up comic. We've had someone that housed many tortoises. And now we have a retired magician. When he was 12 years old, he performed magic trip magic tricks <laughs> and two magic shows do you see how good he is there he actually um made me trip over the word trick and call it trips so that's that's brilliant we can see that you're outstanding even on zoom <laughs> so let's let's get into it let's start with an introduction into your journey into law so let's begin with your first degree and uh, please tell our viewers about a, a, a quick overview of that experience I've got a first degree in law itself. Um, the interesting thing about it is that I did, I completed half my degree in Malaysia, where I'm from. Um, so I did two years here and then I transferred to the University of Leeds in my final year. And the reason why this was the arrangement is because universities in Malaysia uh, do have partnership programs with a number of universities in the UK and they offer a different combination. So you can do a year in Malaysia and do two years in the UK or do two years here um, and one there later. And financially, that was the, the best option to do one year in the UK. And then I stayed on to do the bar course there. Um, so during my time studying my law degree, at least in, in Malaysia, I spent half that time studying the Malaysian legal system and then the other half, the English legal system. Um, and that I think, was the, the, the fun, interesting thing because it was two jurisdictions at all times. You see that even that is super valuable to bring uh, to the UK yourself as an international applicant because it's almost like you have intricate knowledge into dual uh, jurisdictions. So, you know, I must ask you then what, what I know that partially prompted your move to the UK to pursue law. But is there yeah. anything else um, that, that inspired you to, to move over to the UK? Well, the, the, the history of our country is that Malaysia was colonized uh, by England all those years back. And so our legal system in Malaysia is fashioned after the English legal system. And so it, it already is a very common process in Malaysia for law students to do some to, to study in the UK or to spend at least a year in the UK completing their law degrees if they have access to do that. Um, and so my, because my family was able to support me for two years, it seemed like a, a natural step to take so that unfortunately wasn't an inspiring story behind it. It was just um, a, a natural and instinctive decision to make because I, could, I had that support. No, I think that's inspiring enough. Um... I know for a fact that Barbados and many other Caribbean islands uh, were previously colonized by England and we, we follow the same common law system. Uh, the, the law is very, very similar. So it's quite natural yeah. and easy to make that transition. So I completely understand. Now, in terms yeah. of cultural differences, did you find adjusting to studying in the UK quite difficult and and if you found that you had to to make adjustments do you mind describing that for us i i don't think i struggled in terms of an academic a difference in academic culture 
Uh, rather, I think I, I enjoyed it a lot more because or at least given that you're in your final year when I transferred to the UK, I had a lot more independence in deciding what electives I would take um, and the contact hours were fewer. So there was a lot more time spent just reading around areas of law that I was interested in, more time spent thinking and writing. So I think I enjoyed having that flexibility um, as compared to maybe in Malaysia initially, where because you're studying, studying the hard core subjects, that meant that it was a, a little bit more rigorous and rigid. But I do think in terms of adjustment, it was more social that, that required a bit more adjustment because, you know, I was coming in my final year and I'd already spent two years of my university life developing really close friendships. And then having to abandon all of that to move across the world and restart in your final year, that was not something I was prepared for because the law degree itself meant that the entire three years would be assessed on that single year in the UK. That's how I would get my qualifying law degree. The first two years would have no bearing whatsoever. So it meant that making that move almost instantly, I had to be on the ball uh, with my dissertation, with adjusting to living in the UK uh, whilst balancing the demands um, academically. So I struggled a bit initially to find that friend group which I would gel in and, and be comfortable with. Um, and that also meant uh, mental health difficulties followed soon after. But I was able to get the support I needed and family and friends back home were very supportive. So that aided the, the initial adjustment that I had to go through. And that's something that uh, a lot of UK domiciled uh, students and, and persons don't really recognize. Um, international applicants tend to struggle with their mental health, uh, basically because we, we literally <laughs> move our lives away from our friends and families and our traditional support systems and yeah. start to forge new paths. And while doing that, we still have to stay on top of our work demands. We still have to stay on top of any pro bono initiatives in order to enhance our CVs. And we still have to be mindful of home office regulations because yeah. as much as you might want to take a break, sometimes it, it, it just doesn't commit it with, with your leave. Um, things like the no detriment policy and, and persons who are avid watchers of the channel will know that I spoke about that as a, as a potential hurdle. We just can't click pause because we have a timeline and a time frame to do everything. So I'm really glad that you, you spoke about the mental health challenges. Um, it's usually a, a seen as a flashier or a hotter topic to be like, yes, I moved to the UK and I, and I studied there. Yeah. But what people don't know is that there will be a period where you have no friends <laughs> there exactly. in that space. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're absolutely right and spot on with, with identifying the problem um, because usually that move itself is viewed as a very privileged um, journey um, and that you should always be grateful and you're moving to greener pastures. And so it, you should always have a good day when you're in the UK, but that isn't always the case because if you're alone, if, you, if, you, if you're not used to the temperatures, if you're not used to the food, these things that we generally take for granted on a daily basis, that now has a significant impact on how you feel and how you think. And all of a sudden, because of your nationality, you can't let that affect your academic performance as you put. So that is a, a constant struggle, I, I would think. To, to, to go through. Absolutely spot on. Now, I know you would have uh, did the bar course as well. So do you mind providing us with a brief overview of, of that experience? Well, the, the, the bar course itself was where I really crystallized in my mind that I wanted to be a barrister, uh, but more so that I would be good enough to try and secure pupillage in the UK. Um, and the, the reason why I say it was only at this stage that happened is because when I first applied for the bar course, I also applied for scholarships from Deans of Court. Um, and I had attended a scholarship interview where in that interview, which was about 20 minutes long, five or so of those minutes were spent talking about my visa status. And that really put me off internally because I realized that what should have been a, a very administrative discussion suddenly got, you know, meshed in together with a discussion about my merit. 
And I knew the UK domicile students or British citizens would not get asked those questions because there isn't a question of you leaving the country. Um, and whilst I think that is a fair question to ask because it has to do with your future plans, um, any one person is not going to be able to guarantee that they will be able to stay in a specific location for a, a lengthy period of time because you just don't know what's going to happen in your life. And when it does, you will have to make decisions at that point. So I, I, as a result of that experience, I left thinking, you know what, I'll just do the bar course and then I'll return home because it doesn't seem like I'm going to be very much welcome here. Um, but that changed for me during the bar course because I had friends on the course that were very supportive. I grew very close to them. And I started to feel this energy, this, this positive um, energy that, you know, really drove me to want to think about my prospects for applying for pupillage here. Um, and the reason why that happened was because it was the combination of be, being close with new people, going down to London for mooting competitions, doing well in those competitions, the rigor of getting on your feet every few days, then studying the civil and criminal procedure, um, you know, I liked that intensity and I, and I realistically saw myself doing that for a very long time to come. Um, so I think that is how I would look at my bar experience. It really turned the page for me. I really like that, that uh, story because I think it's not really discussed a lot that uh, international applicants have to justify to themselves first why they want to mm -hmm. remain in England and Wales. Uh, because you will be probed about it. Um, and yeah. although you think, you know, other persons wouldn't be probed as much as you will be, you have to know, you know, I, you know, I have to justify this because it seems as though there are additional hurdles, not seems as though there are additional hurdles that we have to overcome, uh, that UK domiciled people will not have to overcome. And we have to satisfy, uh, the pupillage panel, for example, that you are here to stay and that you do want to make a solid contribution to the Bar of England and Wales. But I'm happy that you found that uh, positive support uh, group. I'll say shout out to our internationals in the English Bar group. I'm sure that that's a source of inspiration and positive support for other people. Um, yeah. which he is, which we're both a part of people. So if you are international students or applicants, please do join us. Now, I know you spoke about mooting and um, you know being on your feet, et cetera. Do you think that you can outline for us any work experience, whether legal or non-legal, that you think aided your app pupillage applications? Definitely. Um, I think what really helped is getting experience being on my feet um, and I got that through volunteering as a caseworker with Leeds Free Legal Representation. Um, if you're based in London, you would have the free unit, uh, free representation unit. And, and this time, LFLI had just been created by a group of um, postgraduate students and those who were just starting out in pupillage. And I immediately gotten on my feet representing clients in the employment tribunal. And the thing that I'd say is that there isn't a better way to prove that you can do the job and that you want to do the job by doing the job itself, because this experience led me to do that. Um, I was able to have client conferences, gather evidence, prepare witness statements, appear in the tribunal to cross-examine, make closing submissions. And in fact, I think what it really does is it makes you do both the solicitor's work and the barrister's work as well. So I think that was a turning point for me in two ways. One, it gave, um, I, I would think, gave any pupillage committee the confidence to think that this person knows what the job is like and knows the intricacies of, of the daily demands, like how do you deal with the judge? How do you decide what goes into uh, your line of questions? But two, it also gave me the confidence to know that I can do this and so anything that I write about it, it comes from a genuine point of knowledge as opposed to something I hope I can do. And maybe the experience does it sufficiently. The second part to I, I think my work experience was having a breath of it. So I done some internships with human rights um, organizations, one remotely in London uh, whilst I was in Malaysia. So that really helped with cost. 
because it was in the height of COVID and being able to access that opportunity, I think made a world of a difference for me because you hear about all these applicants who have worked in the UN and have done this and done that. And you think to yourself, how am I going to afford this experience living in London without the kind of pay that needs to come to not just pay for the living cost, but to pay for the visa that requires me to get there. And so having the opportunity to do the internship remotely, I think made a big difference because it was one more thing I could add to uh, my experience and talk about. Um, I don't think there were many other things that really stood out because from the first time I applied. I think it was a combination of these two experiences that, that made it for me. That's wonderful because I think when people struggle to answer that question, um, why do you want to be a barrister? I think sometimes some struggle because they, they haven't had enough actual experience of being on their feet. Because somehow yeah. when you get that experience, when you start getting into those uh, pro bono roles and actually being on your feet and making submissions, the answer pops right into mind and you're able to just write it down. So it's no longer yeah. kind of theoretical or esoteric. It's now right. I know what the job entails. I know the rigorous yeah. demands, and this is why I want to be a barrister. So I, I think that's a really good point to note. Um, so people, I think it's really about getting out there and getting that work experience yes. so that you can you can actually pinpoint elements of the job that you like. Yeah. No, I, um, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, was just, I was just gonna say, I've done, I, I did um, LFLR, being a caseworker remotely, and I still do it remotely. I've not actually been in front of an employment tribunal in person. Um, so I think the fact that the access to such opportunities can be granted remotely is helpful for international students. Um, that might not be the case in a, in, as we come out of COVID, uh, but I think currently where those opportunities still exist, I would encourage everyone to just jump on it as soon as you can while it's still remote. Yeah, and it's wonderful experience to have because COVID ushered in a new era where maybe before we'd think the legal system would only kind of embrace more remote hearings uh, far down the line. But now that we yeah. do have it, I believe there's going to kind of be a hybrid approach going forward. So I think that you really don't have anything to lose um, in terms of getting that kind of remote experience and making submissions with, whether remote or in person. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's just incredible to add to the CV. You do, you do, you do lose sleep. You do lose sleep with the time difference. Um, because I, I remember doing hearings here at 10, 10 p.m. in the evening and I'm thinking, this is not realistic at all to real life practice. So I think, <laughs> keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, of course. Now, can you outline for us any extracurricular activities that you believed also aided that application? The one thing that I, I really took belief in, in terms of an extracurricular activity for me, uh, was competitive debating. And I'd done quite a bit of that at university. And so that gave me the confidence to know that if I have to stand up on my feet at any point to argue on any given topic, even if I don't know anything about it, I have had the experience of being in those positions and I'm not going to be afraid of it. Um, I think it, it wasn't so much that it gave me the confidence to know I'm going to succeed all the time, but it took away some of the fear and the anxiety one might experience being on their feet. So that was one extracurricular activity. Um, the others would, would generally be being involved in a number of um, student societies, especially in committees, because the experience there was having to make quick decisions constantly and to manage competing demands, which are intrinsic features in the profession anyway. You do find yourself as a barrister taking on a lot of responsibility, making snap decisions that have to be informed um, by a variety of considerations. So that um, helped me as well. Um, and I would think in terms of other extracurricular activities, it would also just be that I found ways to do things that were not related to law or debating because one, the one thing we, we may not 
appreciate as we start out because we're very enthusiastic, very energetic, you could spend your entire day talking about law if you wanted to, um, is that actually you're a better student, you're a better professional within the legal within legal practice, if you find time to tune out and to step away from it. Um, so a lot of that came from just going on runs or playing basketball or going to the gym for me, um, as well as watching stand-up comedy. I'm not going to profess that I'm any good at stand-up comedy, but I was having these things that just gave me an outlet to tune off. And then that experience made it easier for me to think clearly about my legal work when I did it. Yeah, agreed. Breaks are needed. They're absolutely vital. And I think we shouldn't get rid of our hobbies. Like that's a big should not. Because you, you, you need that time to, to press that refresh button and reset and come back. Um, because it is, it is a lot of mental heavy, li heavy lifting. So a lot of mental exhaustion can, can seep in. So you need to really have those things that, that you can uh, rely on. I'm happy that you highlighted debating as well. I myself was a fellow debater and especially with impromptu debates, things that you may think, oh my goodness, what is this moot topic? I, I have almost very limited knowledge on it. It helps you to get very comfortable on your feet and, and to really yeah. maximize the, do po the points that you do have. So I think that's really helpful, especially for, um, interviews when they like to throw debate topics <laughs> your way yeah that, that, and, and that's true because the the eventual chambers that i secured pupillage in had a debate topic in the first round and i think that experience really served me well um, but I, I would want to just point out that debating isn't the only way to get advocacy experience in fact in hindsight i do think it's one of the more boring ways to do it because it's such a predictable thing to include in your applications. Um, I do think it's more interesting to say I've done theater or you were uh, uh, someone who gave tours at the museum instead, because there's a lot more to talk about there that isn't predictable than someone who says they've done debating. So please don't feel confined to this single activity. That's true. Well, people know that I love my performing arts people, um, me being a thespian myself. <laughs> I love it. So anyone that's doing stand up comedy or acting or anything, I really yeah. enjoy it. It's great. It's really yeah. good. Now, let's talk about what many people uh, have, have viewed this really to hear now. The, the big hot yeah. topic, pupillage advice. Now, let's start looking at this from, you know, the perspective of an international applicant. How daunting was the process of seeking pupillage as a non-UK domiciled person? It was, it was just constantly dealing with question marks in my mind every day. Um, the first thing that was a question for me was how do I communicate the fact that my law degree was not fully completed in the UK? It's already an issue that I'm an international student who's not gone to Oxford or Cambridge. Then I've not spent three years at a Russell Group University. I've in fact only spent a year at a Russell Group University. And, and I wondered whether this would have a bearing on it because anytime I looked up um, people from different countries who are practicing barristers, they all had, um, they've all lived in the UK for a number of years. They've all been to Oxford or Cambridge or they've done completed masters. And I didn't have any one of these things. So that was a big question mark for me. Uh, the second thing that really stood out is this unspoken assumption. No one really says it, but everyone thinks it. And that is, if you're an international student, the question mark is, when are you going to go back to where you came from? You know, when you're returning home, where is home for you when you're going back? Um, and so what I started to, to feel or the impression that I got is that I would be asked about the fact that I'm not from the UK. So why would I be interested in practice here? It is a very standard question, but I think it comes with a lot of connotations that are unhelpful because that is tied to race and nationality as well. And no one is going to say it directly to your face. Um, the one helpful thing I got to this and that really dispelled this, this difficult assumption I had to reckon with is um, a piece of advice my mentor gave me. And she said, what is the difference between you leaving and returning to Malaysia 
and another barrister leaving that set of chambers and moving to another set of chambers. You're both leaving. In fact, it is more problematic for the UK domicile barrister to leave and move down the street because now they're joining the competitor. You're not going to be part of the competition if you're leaving and returning home. And I thought that makes so much sense. So why is it do I have this, this, this question that sort of gets, gets splashed out in, in many different ways all the time? So that was something I had to reckon with. I also had to find out what the visa restrictions would be. Um, and this meant that when I looked through Chambers websites, and it's now fashionable for every set of Chambers to have a diversity and inclusivity statement, I would look at the characteristics they said they would not discriminate against. You will see that they won't discriminate against race, but nationality is not included in that policy. And, and of course it wouldn't be because it's not a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, but you would hope to see that they wouldn't discriminate against nationality because silently it gives you the reassurance that if you apply here, that's not going to be a question mark in your mind. Um, so it was all of this working in the back of my mind and then thinking, what if I don't have enough time in the UK because of my visa to gain an experience that I can speak about here? Because if I return home to Malaysia and my legal experience begins to be geared towards my time in Malaysia, then it increases that, that initial question even more. You've gone back to Malaysia, why would you come back here? Um, your experience is not immediately relevant here. Um, so I think these are the different factors that played in my mind um, and, and worked as, I think, hurdles that I needed to deal with. I'm glad you highlighted the, the visa issue because many people don't know that we actually can't apply to all the chambers we may want to apply to because they actually don't meet the threshold that the Home Office demands of us in order to yeah. for us to get our, our tier two visa. So actually the pool <laughs> is actually more limited uh, in terms of yeah. accessing chambers for international applicants. Uh, there definitely are chambers that I have, I have seen or that I have a mini with and I have to just say, okay, I, I can't apply to you for, for, um, for pupillage. And I mean, I do encourage people um, to write to chambers and ask them a question about it or let them know your position. I've had a positive and I've had a negative response. One chambers yeah. didn't know. Some people genuinely don't, don't know yeah. and they're willing yeah. to fix that. And to me, that that shows, um, you know, I want to be a, a part of your chambers yep. because you're quite progressive in your mindset. You can you can accept critique and you can understand. Okay, well, well, this isn't working. Let's fix this so that we're we're yeah. uh, lobbying to a more you know equal kind of base and and di imp improving our diversity. Another set just said, well, basically, um, I'm trying to put this as politically correct as I can. This is an issue that you need to take up with with the the bar council. Um, yeah. We we adhere to whatever the minimal minimum threshold is for the purposes of uh, minimum wage. But if there is any other minimum for international students, I, I'm sorry, refer to to the bar council, and that's fine. That's yeah. fine. But I rather ask that question because at the back of my mind, uh, I don't know, can't speak for any other person or any other international applicant but i'm mindful of certain things and i just don't waste my time sending an application there because if you send an application yeah. there and you do get through um ultimately you're wasting chambers time and your own time because you can't demand that they're going to increase that that minimum offer that they that they they put forward so i'm just yeah. stating that you know as as one of the biggest hurdles that some people might not even uh, have in mind when approaching yeah. this process. No, yeah. no I, I, I completely agree. Um, it, I mean, at the back of my mind, I treated it as, a, as an administrative process because from, where, from when I spoke to lecturers or mentors, they said, and even other pupils, the, the, the point that was made is this, that if the set of chambers want you, they will do what they need to do to get you. And I'm, and I'm glad that's true from my experience and they've been very supportive um, thus far about assisting me with my visa um, application. And, and that may not work for you. Um, so I'm glad that, you know, there's a bit more discussion at the moment of reaching out to chambers and cl 
clarifying the position. Uh, my personal experience was just to leave it for when that needed to be raised as an issue. Because if I went to an interview and a set of chambers appeared to not know what the visa requirement was or would want to make that decision instinctively on the fact that they've just not dealt with this, then I don't want to be that. Because the set of chambers I'm going to go to will take that interest and will want to find out um, these things. Yeah, because ultimately, I, I think we as applicants can't shortchange ourselves. Um, you're interviewing chambers just as much as they're interviewing you. You need to be happy that that will be your professional home. And um, you, you don't really want to go someplace where you, you start off feeling a bit uncomfortable um, and a bit unwanted, even if that's not their intention, you know. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we highlighted the, the hurdles. Um, are there any other additional hurdles that you think pops to mind that international applicants face when seeking pupillage? Um, I, I think for me personally, it was just not knowing who I can refer myself to. Who do I compare myself against? Who has got a similar background to me that I know has done it? So that gives me the confidence to know I can do it as well. Um, there were other Malaysian, there are other Malaysian barristers, but they've come into the profession at a very different time with a very different background. And it was hard to draw those similarities. Even when I could speak to other international applicants or pupils, they, they come from different countries and their experiences are also vastly different. So I think it's important to highlight that as an international applicant, if you're applying now and you don't have anyone that's just come before you, it can feel like a lonely experience because you're constantly questioning whether your background fits the chambers pro the average chambers profile. Excellent point. And just to add on to that, it really does show you that equality and diversity actually hinges on what people can see. So exactly. if you want to put yourself forward, sometimes you say, well, let, let me just do some research. Are there any people that look like me? Are there any people that share my background? Okay, if there's no one that looks like me, heck, is there anyone that's there that's from outside of the UK um, that I, I actually think I can I can stand a chance? So I think that's, that's very, very important. Um, it goes beyond the equality and diversity webinars and, and, and talk shops. It's actually, can we see what's, what's uh, represented or what's professed to be represented? No, exactly, and if I could just add, sorry, if I could just add one more point to that to close this off, um, is, is that if you read the, the Bar Standards Board, Board's PPTC roundup that they do every year, almost consistently the split between international students that do the Bar course, um, they stand at least at about 49% of all PPTC students. And yet, a lot of the diversity discussion is geared towards perhaps only those who are um, domiciled in the UK, which is important because there are also systemic issues within them. But I think this, I, I don't know if it's a dismissal or just an ignorance of the fact, but if the broad assumption is that we assume everyone is going to be returning, then are you really positioning the bars as an open place? That, that is what I would leave it at. Absolutely brilliant point. And we even, we're not going to belabor the point, but we even see some, some opinions like that on, on legal Twitter, where some persons just have that kind of opinion where they, where they think, well, you know, international applicants, you don't even have to worry about them because they're automatically returning. So we don't need to worry yeah. about them on pupillage gateway. So there does, there, there is seen, there is some to be some kind of, um, ignorance there and and you know with me using that word ignorance it's just maybe some people genuinely do not know <laughs> and do not understand mm -hmm. and i think that's why we have to kind of carve out our own spaces just to uh say well hey you know equality and diversity extends to us as well <laughs> or all persons that are interested in pursuing the bar mm -hmm. at, uh, of england and wales now what advice mm -hmm. At this point, would you give to non-UK domiciled persons who are interested in obtaining pupillage? I'd say I'd say three things. Um, the first is you have to decide practically what your visa allows you to do. Um, at, at the time when I was applying for the current cycle that eventually helped me obtain pupillage, 
I had to return home with a, within a, a notice of about two weeks because all my attempts to extend my visa to stay in the UK and finish the bar course um, was unsuccessful. Um, it was simply because classes had ended and I could sit for the exams online, so I was expected to return. So that meant that any experience I would gain would have to be done remotely. And if opportunities are not accessible to you remotely, you need to decide what you, what you need to do to get a visa to be in the UK, to gain that experience, to show that you're committed to being here. Because oftentimes that question of commitment simply just requires you to be in the country. And there are so many hidden challenges there that the average uh, barrister who's not an international student will not know. So that's one. You need to figure out what your visa is going to allow you to do and how you, you need to go about that. Uh, the second, I think, fi financially, um, it is a privilege for many of us to be able to come to the UK from our respective countries, um, either because of scholarships or because of, of family support, uh, because loans are not extended by education institutions in the UK to international students. Um, even if you can say gaining legal experience initially means that you may not get paid well, and you need to have a salaried job to be able to maintain that visa in the UK. So the employment circumstances are more restricted for you. Um, and then I think the third is timing. You need to figure out how much time you can give yourself to commit to the cycle because um, a domiciled individual in the UK can fully allow themselves that five years, assuming you can figure out what to do financially. But if you are not from the UK and you can't stay there for very long and you may not have as much funds, then you may only have fewer cycles to attempt to get that pupillage. So I think these, this is not advice that is specific to pupillage applications, but I think it's important consideration to even get you through the door to want to make um, pupillage applications. And unfortunately, that's where we have to start, I think. Excellent points, uh, excellent observations. I think to the the underlying thing here um, for, for, for our very keen listeners is access to finances because fees mm -hmm. are very expensive and for some of them you actually have to prove that you have um, over a certain amount of savings as well okay. on your application and that has nothing to do with the application fee and you have to pay those things as a one-off it's not um, okay something that you can pay in installments. So I'm, I'm glad as well that you've kind of highlighted that it's it's almost up. We're already starting at a privileged position in terms of finances, because those of us that are less fortunate, unfortunately, it, it just isn't available as an option. Yeah. Uh, so yes. I'm glad I'm glad that you, you highlighted that. Now, just yeah, slightly man. turning a bit to common law pupillage itself, why did you choose to apply for a common law pupillage? If I'm being honest, it's because I get bored easily. Um, and, and, and I say this with a pinch of salt. Of course, the work, any, anything I do, I'm, I'm going to be interested in it. I'm going to dedicate myself to it. But I didn't want to close myself off initially. Um, I do think a, a generalist exposure to start off teaches me a lot more in terms of my skills, because if, you, if I'm doing criminal advocacy, then I'm doing a lot more oral advocacy. And then if I'm you know, doing civil matters, I get a lot more experience doing paperwork and drafting um, submissions. And I think the combination of these things, when they work together, make you a more all-rounded uh, barrister. And I also think the law is fluid. You can enter into an employment uh, here and deal with an employment matter and have to be very aware of human rights and have to be aware of civil procedure. You can go into a, a criminal case and, and require that same rigor to deal with numbers if your case has that. Um, so I think that's why I wanted to go into a common law pupillage to start off with because that generalist grounding is going to give me the skills I need to specialize later on once I'm more certain and more informed of that what the future looks like. What kind of experience should persons seeking a common law pupillage have on their applications? Um, I, I think to, to be as very broad brushed as possible. So in, in my background, I made sure to get some experience in 
firms that specialize in commercial law. Um, and then when I interned with organizations that dealt with human rights, that gave me a different perspective. My mini pupillages were in criminal law. So I got to see jury advocacy. And I think it was the combination of these things. And even doing with LFLR, I was doing employment law. Um, so what that does for my application is two things. Number one, it shows that I am fluid in my ability to do well in each of these fields based on the experiences that I put forward. Um, and number two, it also confirms to the pupillage panel that I can be trained easily because I'm not rigid in my understanding of only one um, practice area and that I can pick things up quickly enough. So I think that's, that's how I think it helps the, the application. I think I think that definitely songs are like the best approach. Now, could you provide some top tips for the written stage of the process? Yes, I, I have I have three I have three tips tips, um, and I think the from there you can guess one of the tips, and that is to be structured and succinct um, with anything you put forward. But I'll come to that as a second tip. The first tip I think is to to take a step back and really ask yourself this. Applying for pupillage is not really a question of what I can do to make the best written application, but what you can do to be a good barrister. Because you have five years that you are going to try and secure that pupillage, and you need to think about this process as a long-term one. We often think of it as the longer I need to take to try and get a pupillage, the more disadvantageous it is for me. But actually, if you think about it from the perspective of what you can do to become a good barrister, then you are using that time to gain experiences that will develop your skills for when you get pupillage, not if you get pupillage. Because it, it, it adds up such that a person who's spent four years doing paralegal experience, working in different um, regulatory organizations, is going to be able to start at a more experienced point, having worked four years compared to someone who's maybe fresh out of university and a secure pupillage. Maybe they've got more years to get on their feet, but you've got a lot more experience. So I think as, as a mental model for, for approaching written applications, it's to ask yourself what you can do to be a, a good barrister first. The second, if we now begin to zoom into written applications is this, it is to find a way to think clearly. We write applications thinking we need to tell the pupillage panels everything about our lives because we don't know what's going to stick and volume is going to help. But if you think clearly, you can really narrow in on each experience you have and decide what is going to be relevant and what is not going to be relevant. And thinking clearly takes time. So if you, the earlier you start, the more time you have to think through the answer you're putting forward. So give yourself time to think. The third tip I have is to be persuasive, not descriptive in your applications. So one thing we like to do is we like to describe to our pupillage panel, the variety of things we've seen in a mini pupillage or the list of things you've done and work type of work experience. But if you're merely describing it and you're outlining what you've done, you're not making the case for why they should pick you you are just giving them uh, an oral history or written history of yourself. But being persuasive means deciding what in that experience is going to help put my best, the best version of myself forward. What in that experience is going to communicate the most relevant skill and how all of that is going to tie in together. So if you're being persuasive, you also look at the written application as starting from the moment you detail your work experience. Because if I've written something in that work experience, I want to make sure I either expand on it in more detail in the Q&A, or I touch on something else that I've not included in the written experience, so it does not become repetitive. Um, that might be an approach to take with being persuasive. But those are my top three tips for written applications. And those are absolutely brilliant. And there's something that you said that really stood out to me. I think we view pupillage in terms of the five years after that you have um, yeah. more as a negative if you don't get it on the first or the second or even the exactly. third and you're going for a fourth or fifth cycle. 
we view it as a yeah. negative. But I am so happy that you actually kind of turned around that narrative and said, hang on a second. It's not a question of if you're going to get pupillage, it's when you're going to get pupillage. And actually those five years um, are actually allowing you to accumulate the experience you need to be a very yeah. effective barrister. People usually see it because some, some people are saddened. Some people are ashamed that they're at a third or fourth cycle of applications. But I think what you said there literally needs to be blasted on every social media platform for um, all legal audiences, because we need to kind of eradicate that kind of shame about about applying two and three and four and five times or even applying for for extended periods of time to obtain that pupillage. Yeah. really just see it as as an opportunity to keep gaining keep gaining because you're never losing anything on your cv you're just always exactly. adding um and and, and the the if it I, I can't i couldn't be more clear than this when you become a barrister you're going to be doing that for the rest of your life if you have a long career so these are your last five years to do anything else you want um and and be as bold and be as creative as possible don't run away from the law but do everything else that you want to do. In fact, um, just after I submitted my pupillage applications, I started working on a couple of podcasts. Um, and I thought, okay, if I have to apply again, I'm going to be able to talk about this because when I do practice as a lawyer, I'm never going to be working on podcasts anymore. I don't think it's going to be feasible to gel that together. Um, so that was how I saw it. I absolutely love that perspective. It's unique. I love it. I think it should stick. I hope everyone watches this this episode. <laughs> now, do you think that there's a way that applicants can make themselves memorable in the written stage? I think it's this, and I mean, I'm borrowing a piece of advice I saw on legal Twitter. Um, in fact, just before I get to it, I know when we, when we are on legal Twitter, especially in this period, everyone is giving you advice and that can be overwhelming in terms of deciding what you're going to use and what's not going to use because all these people have gotten people in, so I must apply everything. Um, too many cooks can spoil the stew is, is one way to look at it. Uh, but I think really it's an, it's an exercise of judgment because judgment is going to be a constant feature in your practice as a barrister. So you need to decide for yourself what works in terms of the advice given by other people. Um, and it's on this basis that I'm going to borrow a piece of advice for, from another person I saw on Twitter. I don't remember their name, but I would credit them otherwise. And they said this, there is no template for the best candidate. Rather, it is how you put forward the best version of yourself that is going to stand out. So I think it's, it's about just forgetting what other people can look like on their privilege applications and just recognizing there's only one version of you that's going to exist in that application that anyone is ever going to see. So sell that version. Brilliant, again. <laughs> How should persons prepare for common law sets interview processes? I, I don't think it's very different from other pupillage interview processes. Rather, it's going to be more specific to the set of chambers that you're applying to. Um, because each set of chambers, whether or not they're offering a common law pupillage, will have a unique interview process. So I think once you get that interview offer, the best thing to do is to find out what that interview process is. Um, I was fortunate enough that I had the opportunity to network with pupil barristers from um, the set of chambers that I'll be going to. So the, when it came, when the interview period came around, I asked them what the process would look like. And in fact, um, chambers will tell you what it is. So I think once you get to that process, then you know what you need to put forward. Um, so at least speaking from my personal experience, I knew there would be a debate topic because I'd applied the year before and, and that was what I experienced. So I knew I, it wasn't so much about convincing them about my skills and, and what my CV had, but rather to just focus on putting forward an argument and doing that well. So that was an intrinsic feature um, in that interview process. I don't think there is anything unique to a common law pupillage and why the interview process would be different. I think it's more the chamber structure and finding out what that is. See, I asked that question because I know some people can get a bit panicked about 
the amount of practice areas that Chambers may be yeah. offering and trying to keep up to date with all the news um, that those practice areas mm -hmm. uh, offer. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, I think some people sometimes get a bit panicky because at least with, with yeah. one or two specialties, you kind of know, mm -hmm. okay, all right, personal injury, yeah. this may occur. Um, I might have to make an application in terms of for an interim injunction or something like that. So I've just asked about it because I think some yeah. people um, may be a bit concerned about the breadth of the practice areas and, and what can be applied and what can be asked. Right, so I, I understand the question better now and I think my, my answer to it would be this. Um, the likelihood is that if you are applying for a specialist privilege, the, the, re the requirement for you to know about that practice area is going to be a lot higher because there's just that one practice area. Um, but if it's a common law pupillage, then find out what junior barristers at a set of chambers are working on, because that's going to be your initial period um, doing that kind of work. So at least I know at the set of chambers, I'll be going to criminal and family law um, were a common feature in, in the type of work juniors do. So I made sure I, I understood what the challenges are in each practice area. I also think if you speak about a specific practice area in your pupillage application, be sure to know about it. Um, so I spoke about employment law um, from my experience. So I made sure I knew what the specific issues were in that practice area to be able to bring that out. Um, and and I, the reason why I pinpointed it in this way is because as, as, you, as you said, it's such a broad area. How do we narrow it down? I think this might be some ways to look at it. Now, do you think that there are any top tips that uh, common law applicants can apply for both interview stages? As in the first round and the second round interview stages? Yes, please. Um, well, I, I don't think, at least from my experience, there is a, a large question about the practice area itself, but more in terms of going about the interview generally. And I think what was most helpful for me this time is making sure I controlled my nerves. And I think it, it's this, some people get nerves throughout the entire day of the pupillage interview or even days before. For me, it, it never really got to me until the minutes before I logged onto the call or when I'm just sitting quietly before and looking at my screen, waiting for the interview to start. And then at that point, I start to wonder what's going to happen. And that's when the nerves get to me. What I realize helps is to have something on in the background that can distract you or that can make you feel good. Um, so I listen to speeches, I think, that I really enjoy listening to in the background. And I had it on. So, you know, once the interview started, I just closed the tab. Um, at times, I also watch stand-up comedy because I think that helped me. The laughing just put me at ease. So that mental um, preparation, is what, that's one of the ways to do it. I, I think, unfortunately, your options are a bit more limited if you are in doing the interview in person, um, unless, of course, you can plug in your earphones and watch something. But I think, in fact, if it's in person, take the opportunity to speak to the people around you, um, the clerks, um, the other candidates, because that will put you at ease as well. It just gets that conversation, that ability to speak going. So just before that interview, um, it, you, you'll feel settled in. And I think that's important in any interview stage is just to feel settled and to get that interview going. Uh, the second tip I'd have is to be, is to say to take time during the interview process because they will ask you a question that you may not know the answer to, but instinctively you want to answer because that's expected of you. But if you take time and you say, I, I'm going to take a minute or 30 seconds to think about this question, that shows your ability to control the room. Because suddenly you've taken control of this interview. You are deciding that for the next 30 seconds, you're not going to speak, I'm not going to speak, I'm going to think, and then put forward my answer. So I can do that. There are questions that, that, will, that will be put to you which you will not know the answers to. So think about it. Um, the third tip I, I'd say is, is this, is to have structure. In any interview process you go through, structure your answers so that you, you can give a one-liner to say, this is what my answer is, yes or no. And then I have 
four points or three points to make and then go through it in that structure because it helps them, it helps you become memorable during that interview. So unfortunately, I think my tips are not very specific to common law itself because that was not how the interview process was like for me. Uh, but I think these are the other nuances that I picked up that were helpful. Now, this has been extremely helpful. Um, it's always refreshing to hear from a fellow international applicant, someone who's been successful. And I am really grateful that we did carve out time to have this episode. I definitely think it's going to be super beneficial uh, to other international applicants and UK domicile persons um, in terms of increasing awareness of, of international students' issues and also getting them in tip-top shape to apply for that common law pupillage. So I'm super grateful and I am so thankful uh, that you spent some time with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Mia. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks everyone and we'll see you on the next video. Bye guys, take care of yourself.